going to ask our kids to come on up this morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Anything good happened to anybody this week? Anything good? Something happened to you, Maddie, didn't it? What happened this week? You got saved. You did. You accepted the Lord. Well, I want to talk to you about that a little bit, um, because as you grow up, you know, we talk about accepting Jesus as our Savior a whole lot, but I want to show you what these things have in common with what we're doing today. At the end of the service today, we're going to take uh, communion. We call it the Lord's Supper. Does anybody know what the Lord's Supper is? You've seen it before? (coughs) Ethan, I know you've seen it before. Have you seen it before? You're going to help me out, have you? You've seen it? You're going to raise your hand? Okay, all right. That's fine. Um, This that we're going to give out today, does anybody know what that is? What is it? What is it? What is it, Don? I'm going to give you all the gummies this morning because you're the only one that's going to talk to me. Does anybody else want to talk? Because if you don't want to talk, then I won't give you gummies. Anybody, you ready to talk? Okay. Does anybody know what this is? Bread, right? What is it? Rep, good job. What is it again? Say it loud. Well, louder than that. Good job. Good job. Here you go. Where's my gummies at, man? I need to give, I need to give Joshua. There's a pack for just being vocal this morning. Tell you what. Here's, here's five packs for being vocal this morning. All right. Good job, Joshua. All right. Does anybody know what this is? What is it? All right. Now, does anybody know what this bread represents? Jesus' body, hey, there you go. You're with us now. So it represents Jesus' body. Why in the world would we eat bread representing Jesus' body? Here's why. Because Jesus was real, just like me and you. And Jesus went through and suffered a lot of pain. He did. I mean, pain that really hurts. Jason, come here a second. So if if. You know that you're made with a body just like Jason. If I were to grab Jason's cheek right here and pinch it, does that hurt, Jason? Yes. If I turn it like that, that, that's real pain. And we think that's pain. Does anybody else here want to be pinched? All right, no, because it's pain. You know what? Jesus got more than just pinched. They really did a lot of bad things to Jesus. And you know why he let them do it? He let them do it because he loves you. He let them be able to hurt his body and crucify his body. But his body, well, Jesus was the only man that never sinned. So what he wants you to do when you take this bread is to remember that he gave his body to be crucified and beaten. And they mocked him and they called him bad names and they put him on a cross. He gave his actual body that actually really hurt. But he hurt for us because he loved us. And then when we take this cup, this cup, you know what it represents? Represents his blood. Do you know, how many of you have ever had a boo-boo and it bled a little bit? Anybody? Right. You don't like that. Immediately, you want to get what put on it? What do you want somebody to put on it? Band-Aid, right? You want it to stop bleeding. You know that Jesus bled every drop of blood out of him? Why? Because he loved you. And so when we take this today, it's not that we're just taking it saying, okay, I know that sometime Jesus, he died on the cross. No, anybody can say that. When you take it today, you're saying, I took his body and his blood into my heart. And I said, I want to use it and I want to accept it because I want Jesus to be my savior. I want him to forgive me of my sins. That's what Maddie did the other day. That's what some of you have done before. And so what I want to tell you is this today, you'll hear me say something. And this is what Jesus said, do it in remembrance of me. You know what he wants us to do? He wants us to remember what he did. Remember what he did. And so when we remember the bread, Well, the bread represents his what? We learned this, right? What's the bread represent? His body. And he said, my body that was broken for you. When we remember the bread by eating it, then we're saying, I know that I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. And I know life is busy. And I know we can think about a lot of other things. But I want to remember that Jesus gave his life for me. And when we take the cup, we say, I want to remember that Jesus gave all of his blood for me. He died on the cross for me so that I could be saved from my sins. And so today... If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you don't quite understand it. When you see this being passed out today, 
Well, here's what you have to know. It's not a snack. It's not a little treat at the end of the service. And if you haven't accepted Jesus yet, or maybe you don't know, and you see your parents taking it or the people around you taking it, if, if they say you can't have it, well, don't say a whole lot now, but ask them when they get home why you can't have it. They'll explain to you that it's for people who have already been saved, okay? And they'll explain to you everything about being saved. Does that make sense? All right, so let's pray together. Lord, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for these children. I pray, God, that they're always bold in being able to show their love for you, to be able to proclaim their love for you. And Lord, I just pray that they would realize what you've given to them and that gift of love, your body and your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Who wants gummies? All right. There you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. <clears throat> Depending on how quiet it gets in here this morning, I'll be passing out gummies. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so this morning... I want to talk to you about something the Lord had laid on my heart, and we're going to go through some scripture because it will be the Word of God that proves this. So if you have your Bible, please stand up and raise it above your head and bear witness of God's Word. Beautiful. Look around you. Isn't that beautiful? You know, it's the Word of God that keeps us alive. Not just life, but eternal life, our spiritual life. It's the Word of God. It's not what you eat. It's the Word of God. He says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen? You may be seated. Now, how many of you will be taking notes today? Anybody? Raise your hand if you'll be taking notes. All right. So, I'm going to give you all these passages of Scripture so that you can write these down. And then it will be up to you to turn to them at the appropriate times. I'm going to tell you where we're going to start, where we're going to end. But I want to give you this because we're going to walk our way through the Bible to be able to see what God says about this bread, about the bread of heaven, about the bread of life. You know, we're taking in communion today the, the bread and the cup. And so many times we look and we see that, hey, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He was wanting us to remember not just his life, but, but what his life stood for. And so... I want us to be able to go and start at the beginning, work our way through, and I'm going to try to be timely. I know at the end of this, we're going, to, we're going to receive the bread and the cup. But I hope when we do, that you have an understanding, and I hope that you can, you can say that I didn't just come to church and we had communion. I took communion, and I remembered the bread. I remembered the cup. You see, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And why would he say that? Well, here's why. Because each one of us have had our own difficulties and problems this week, right? Each one of us have had our own struggles. And then each one of us has our own goals and aspirations. We each have something that we wish would happen and our mind gets on it. And so because our mind gets on those things, we fail to remember the most important things, right? So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 3. And you can turn to Genesis chapter 3. Those taking notes, you can write Genesis 3. Now, the next place will be is Exodus chapter 16. You don't have to turn there, but note takers, Exodus 16. After that will be in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I know Deuteronomy is a long word, so I'll give you a little bit extra time to write that. Then we'll be in John chapter 6 and finish in Luke 22. And we'll be in John chapter 6 the most. So uh, those of you that are turning, Genesis 3 and John 6 will help you out a lot. We'll be in Deuteronomy quite a bit too, but I want to be timely with God's word. When you're ready, say I'm ready. In Genesis chapter 3. We know as God created the heavens of the earth and he put man in the garden of Eden and he set man up so perfectly. He said, 
I'm going to put you here. And in this garden, you may freely eat of anything in the garden. I'm setting it up for you. All I want you to do is just go and pick it and tend it and take care of it. But man, I want you to be clear to understand, man didn't have to work for what he ate. All he had to do is just go and pick it. You say, well, he had to harvest. No, it was all around him. And God grew it. There was no farming. Adam didn't farm. There were no thorns, no thistles in the original Garden of Eden. There was no sin yet. So Adam and Eve were able just to take with whatever they want. One, one stipulation of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Do not take of it, for the day you take of it, you shall surely die. Talking of spiritual death. So, in this Garden of Eden, they lived, they existed until one day. They were tempted. And they were tempted to take of the, the tree that they shouldn't have. And we say, uh, we look in there and we see that Eve said, well, it's because that, that fruit was pleasing to their eye and good for food. But no, it was because the devil tempted her that it would make one wise. And she took the fruit she gave to Adam. So they sinned. Everybody with me so far? They sinned. And because they sinned, the curse of sin came unto the world. It means that man had stepped outside of God's provision and man had said, I'm going to do it my way, my own way, and I'm going to go against what God says. Going against what God said is your best definition of sin. So there was a punishment. God, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but God issued a punishment. We call it the curse of sin. Read it with me in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 17 through 19, and unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and it's not a sin to listen to your wife, by the way, I've heard this, but it is if she's listening to the devil, right? And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Boy, everything's going to change, isn't it? Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herbs of the field. Now, listen to verse 19. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, from the dust thou art, and from the dust you shall return. I want you to notice this. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat what? Somebody tell me. Bread. Tell me again. Bread. A little bit louder. Bread. Tell the person beside of you. Bread. Out of the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. Does that sound enjoyable? No. And sometimes life isn't enjoyable, but do you know that we're still eating bread out of the sweat of our face? That means that no more is it just that God is providing. We wanted to do it our own way. We're doing it our own way. This is the curse of sin. And so what he's saying is before the curse, God supplied everything and man was given everything to enjoy. But because of sin, man would have to labor and struggle to eat bread. Now, eating bread is not just eating bread. A yeast roll. It's not just eating one of those types of bread that you can get at one of the sandwich shops. Eating bread is to be fed and nourished so they could continue living. So eating bread is not just the picture of eating bread. It's, it's a phrase that's given that is meaning to us to continue to live. Any food or even any kind of sustenance, any kind of income, anything that you have. Back in the 70s, we even called, or they even called. I remember people telling me that, that we're born in the 70s. No, I'm just kidding. I remember in the 70s, uh, you know, the big phrase was, hey man, give me some bread. What did that mean? Money, right? So bread is sustenance, is what you need to survive. Out of the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. So we have that point, right? Now, Go to Exodus chapter 16. We see in Exodus chapter 16 that this became an issue when the children of Israel were freed from bondage in Egypt and they were in the wilderness hungry. They were thinking about Egypt and everything that they have and we see that God provided bread for them. Before I even get into this story, does anybody know what that bread was called? It was called manna. So if you read Exodus chapter 16 and you read uh, these first verses it says, and they took their journey from Elam, all the congregation of the children of Israel, and they came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured 
against Moses, murmured. You know what murmured? I want to take just a minute and talk to you about murmuring. Murmuring is when you're talking, not in public, but you're talking under your breath. And murmuring in the Bible is related to gossip, is related to discord, is related to complaining. That murmuring, that's the conversation that a couple of people have when they're not happy with something. So they go to somebody else to try to form their group of murmuring and, and it gets to be uh, something of contention and, and it divides. It divides families, it divides church, it divides work relationship, that murmuring. They begin to murmur against Moses. He was leading against God. And he goes on to tell you in this, hey, listen, you're not just murmuring against Moses. God said, you're murmuring against me. And so what did he do? I want you to see, we, we read these verses, two and three. It says, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, would to God that we have died in the land of the Lord thy God, that we have died in the land of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to full. I remember when we used to have all this bread. That's what they were saying. And now we're hungry. Verse 4. I want you to see what God says to them. Verse 4. He said, okay. The Lord told them through Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them. You know what he said? He said, I'm going to make the bread, I'm going to deliver the bread, but I'm going to test you with the bread. He said, what do you mean? The manna was just a joyful time where the manna fell. What do you mean he's going to prove them? That means he's going to test them. He was saying, okay, I'm going to provide manna. It's going to rain bread from the sky. Did you hear that? Rain bread. Now, the testing was this and if you read the rest of chapter 16, which we won't today, but I encourage you to. It says that they were given the manna, but the manna only fell on a day they could gather. I, I, I want to explain to this, this to you. They could gather all that they could eat for that day. If they kept any more than they could eat, it would spoil it would rot and worms would get in it. So they had to go out each day and gather. Every day. That means that they had to look every day and say, is God going to rain bread from heaven for me today? And so if he's going to rain bread from heaven for me today, I'm going to go out and I know that God's supplying my need today. And tomorrow he's supplying my need tomorrow. And the next day he supplied, and a couple of people tried to gather more up, you know, because that's the way we do sometimes. We like to get as much as we can from God, and then we'll just not go out the next day and serve him, right? That's right. But he said, no, it'll spoil. There was one exception. He said, on the sixth day, you can gather enough for two days, and it won't spoil. And sure enough, they could gather enough for two days, and it wouldn't spoil. That's just God, isn't it? Same manna falling on the same ground, but it wouldn't spoil. Why? He said, because, hey, this day that I gave you called the Sabbath is sacred to me. I want you to rest from your labors. I don't want you to be involved in thinking, I can go and do this, or I'll make a little money here, or I'll go here and do this, or this will be good for me, and put all of my work aside. And you know, we do that today. We take this day, and we just give it to everything else, and we try to work church in. Or we try to work a little bit of something in it. If we have a job opportunity or an opportunity to just sort of advance us or, or even as we grow up and we say, hey, listen, uh, hey, I would be there, but I've got this or that. He said, hey, this is important. It's so important. I'm going to give you two days supply so that you can focus on me that other day instead of focusing on gathering the, the bread that you need to sustain. Boy, where did we go off track? So they saw it. And I want to make sure we understand what manna is. If you were to look at verse 4, 15, it says, When the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. For they wist not. That means they did not know what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Imagine that first manna falling. You know what they said? What is it? What is it? What is it? You know what manna means? What is it? That's the definition of manna. What is it? How about that? You thought it was going to be something. No, that's the definition. Manna is called what is it? It means they didn't know. 
But Moses explained what it was. Manna, he said, is the bread that the Lord hath given you to eat. Now, it was supernaturally produced by God and supernaturally sustained by God. It would spoil if you didn't use it on that day, except what was gathered on the sixth day, and it would last two days so that they could honor God on the seventh day. Now, that we know a little bit about manna, go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, you realize you turn quite a few pages from Exodus. Now, I want to just teach a little bit. From Exodus to Deuteronomy, there are a lot of things that happen in the wilderness. From Exodus to Deuteronomy, there were things that were set up. He instituted uh, the way that he wanted to be worshipped. Between Exodus 16 and Deuteronomy, the law was established as far as that first generated Um, uh, tablets of stone you were able to see a lot of things happen you were able to see a lot of murmuring if you go through there but you were able to see God's hand continue to provide you were able to see them on their journey but when you get to Deuteronomy you know this is when Moses was getting ready to step out of the picture before Joshua came in and Moses was speaking to them again in Deuteronomy 8 he said here's one thing that is very important He said, all these things that God has done for us from this journey from Exodus to Deuteronomy, and of course he didn't say that, but I'm saying it because that's the time frame. He said, there's one important thing that you need to do, and that one important thing is remember. You said, remember what? Remember. Say it with me. One more time. Do you know how important it was for them to remember what God had done? You say, why is that so important? It's the same issue that we have. We get steeped in our problem or we face some adversity or we get to a place of of uncertainty or logical uncertainty. You know what we start to do? We begin to murmur. You know what solves and, and, and vanquishes murmuring? Remembering. Remembering what God has done. He said it's important that you remember, but I want you to see specifically what he was talking about remembering because he makes a a specific plea here that says, remember the bread. Remember the bread. Say it with me. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it tells us in these first verses, it says, In all the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember, hey, here's that word again, right? Thou shalt what? Remember Remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. To what? To humble you and to prove you. That means to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep the commandments or not. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, listen to this, and fed thee with what? Which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. He explained it. He said, I want you to remember, hey, specifically, remember that the Lord fed you, but what you wanted to be fed is not what you live by. Anybody have breakfast this morning? Anybody hungry again? Why? Why? Because that sustenance wears off, doesn't it? You see, he's saying, you don't live by bread alone. You live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is the bread. And the bread that you saw coming from heaven, that is God fulfilling his promise. That's God's provision. That is God giving you what we'll see is a foreshadowing of what we need to live by. Now, it was not this bread that called manna that kept them alive. It was the commandment of God that kept them alive. He's the one that spoke this unknown substance into existence. God said, or Moses told them, God will rain down bread from heaven. That took God to do that. So it wasn't the word, it wasn't the actual manna. It was God saying, I'm going to let this happen. I'm going to let this happen. Do we forget sometimes in our quest to make our own bread that it's God that's the baker? We forget Our father owns the bakery. So God's commandment was for them to gather it daily so that they could see his provision daily and know that by the mouth of the Lord, they would be taken care of. Jesus alluded to this, didn't he? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, 
Do you remember this portion of Scripture where Jesus was teaching to pray? He even alluded all the way back to him. He said, give us this day our what? Do you know that's a reference to the manna that fell? You have a lot of people that are talking about, hey, we should just look at one day and know that we're worried about today. I agree, but it's a reference back to the manna that fell. Give us this day our daily bread. Who's going to supply my need today? God is, right? And that's a physical need too. Now, you'll also know that this passage of Scripture was so important that Jesus used it to battle temptation from the devil. In Matthew 4 and Luke 4, when the devil said, hey, Jesus, I want you to go outside of what you're supposed to do. I want you to go against God, and I want you to prove your own power. You can change these breads in this, this, these stones in the bread. Stones in the what? Go back and read it sometime. Stone in the what? In the bread. You can do it. Boy, isn't that where we fall off right then? Boy, I'm going to put this plan in place and I'm going to change these stones in life to bread. I'm going to do this and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And I've got a plan going and if I can get this way, then my job will be better. My pay will be better. My income will be better. My material possessions will be better. My retirement will be better and I will be happy. And in that whole struggle of our plan, listen, the bread comes and it goes and it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. And we're, we're counting on our plan to make our own bread. And that's what the devil was trying to get Jesus to do. Make your own bread. And Jesus said, well, it's written. You know what Jesus was saying? Hey, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What does that mean? That means that man can ask God and God can grant, but it ain't up to man, it's up to God. And so... He straightened the devil out there, and the devil, after a couple of times, the devil couldn't battle the word, and he left. There's a good clue for us, right? Be able to throw the word at him, he can't stand it. Now, it goes on to say in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and it's a very important chapter because this word of God coming through Moses to the children of Israel, God's chosen people, this word was basically to sum up in this word, God was telling them not to forget who he is, not to forget that it's him that supplies every need that they have. It's in his power that they exist, even though they live under the curse of sin, which means it will require their own labor. Now remember, the curse of sin requires our own labor to work for the bread that we eat. They can't begin to think that it's in their own power that the, the bread is provided. Now, I want to show you through the word. This is verse 16 through 20 of that same Deuteronomy 8. The Bible says, listen, this is our clue. He tells us the same thing. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do good in the latter end? And thou, sh- and, and thou say in thy heart, my power and might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember. There's our word again. What's our word again? Amen. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. It is he that established his covenant with thee. Swear to your fathers as it is to this day. And it shall be, if thou shalt do all and forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. He says you need to remember where your bread's coming from. Anybody worry at all this week? Because something wasn't happening in your plan the way you planned it? You know what your plan is all geared toward? Your bread, whether it's food, whether it's sustenance, whether it's income, whether it's wealth, or whether it's the way you want something to work out that brings you something into you, whether it's happiness, it's your bread. And when our bread doesn't come to us the way that we want to, then we'll eventually see we can't supply our own bread. And he said, remember, remember. Now, Verse 18, thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Listen to this. And young people, I want you to listen to this. A lot of older people have realized this already, and some haven't, but I want you to listen to these words. Read it right out of the Bible. For thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. 
For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. All power comes from God. You say, well, I've had things work out the way I wanted them to before. And you know, that wasn't always a good thing. That just made you more confident in yourself. That was part of the test. Don't forget, he said in verse 16, that your bread comes from me. Don't forget and don't begin to think in your heart that you're living under your own power, he said in verse 17. Remember the Lord thy God, he said in verse 18. God said it's crucial that you remember who he is. Remember who we are. He's God and we're not. It's him that gives us everything in life. We don't have the power ourselves to give our own selves life and sustain ourselves. So God wants us to continually remember that we need him to live. Even down to the fact of showing the children of Israel that they couldn't gather up more manna in one day so they could live off of it in their own plan the next day. Even as technical as that was. And today, we're thinking we're getting ahead if we can rob a little bit out of a day that is designated to worship Him. A day that we've set aside to worship Him. If we can rob a little bit out of that day and get a couple of things done on our schedule, guess what we're doing? We're trying to make our own manna. And God said, that's a day that I wanted you to think about me and the six days I provided for you. Guess what it'll get you? Not further ahead. Anybody ever got further ahead? from taking the Lord's, the, the day that's designated from the Lord, to the Lord. Anybody ever got further ahead by doing that? Why do we keep thinking then that we can't just give him a day and designate it to him? I can remember a time in my life when I thought, hey, listen, you know what? That's another day, and if I work this day and I work for them, then here's what's going to add up. And it was me choosing. Oh, d- don't get all defensive and say, well, they're making me do this or making me do I'm not talking, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you making a choice to do it. But I made a choice to do it. I made a choice to do it. And my choice said, if I can just gather up four more days out of the week, I'm going to get this further ahead. And if I can make $1,000 in those four days extra, then something would break that was $1,200 to fix. And that's the way it kept being. Because God couldn't let my plan work out. You know, I was gathering up. That's another sermon. We'll preach it later. But what God was saying in Deuteronomy 16, 20, to sum it up, remember the bread. You see, he continually through through Scripture gave us this same theme in Psalms. 105, and you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. He says, basically, to to paraphrase that whole one through five, it says, give thanks to God. It says, sing about his wondrous works. Glory in his name. Seek him and rejoice in him. Speak to the Lord. Uh, Seek the Lord. Speak to him. Seek his strength. Seek his face evermore. And then in verse five, it says this, Psalms 105, five. Remember, what's our word again? Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and judgments of his mouth. Remember, what is he saying? Remember, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He goes on to say in verse 40, you say, how do you know he's talking about that? Well, I I peeked ahead. Verse 40 of that same chapter, see if you think it's talking about it. Verse 40 of Psalms 105, I'll take time to read it to you. Pretty important. And you can gather whether you think he's talking about it or not. It says, the people ask, and he brought quails and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. What do you think he's talking about? Somebody tell me. What was it? It was that manna. He's saying, remember the bread of heaven. Now, I want you to be in John chapter 6. I want to walk through this story and We're not going to do an extensive study on it, but I want to show you how it all ties together because this is Jesus himself. And if you read John chapter 6, you'll see that beginning of John chapter 6, the disciples 
They had just witnessed this great miracle. He fed the 5,000. And Jesus got in a boat, or, or the disciples got in a boat. Jesus went to the mountain. He came later on walking on the water. They were scared to death. He got in the boat. They went over to Capernaum. And we get down to verses 22 through 25, and the people were looking for Jesus in Capernaum. And, and he had just fed all of these people, and they were following him. And in verse 22 through 25, it tells us they were looking for him. And then when they found him, verse 26, they had asked him, Jesus, we didn't see you leave. Where did, when did you come back here? And Jesus told him in verse 26, he says, you're looking for me because I gave you bread and fish. And you were able to eat your fill. Now this is important because Jesus knew they were seeking him for the material bread. They were seeking him because they had a physical hunger. Boy, that's a good motivator, isn't it? Physical hunger. It changes us. There's a lot of people in here that need a stickers when they get physically hunger, right? We need it. It motivates us to do something, to go somewhere, to get something, to work. Hunger is a great motivator. But he said, you're seeking me because you, you got your belly full. You're not seeking me. You, you missed my message that I gave you when I gave you the fish and the bread. You missed it. You were so focused on the miracle that you missed the message. And he goes on to say, and I want you to listen to this command in verse 27. He says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So this meat, guess what it is? It's bread. It's the same context in the same word. It's sustenance. They were so willing to put forth their labor and their effort to get their immediate needs satisfied. They wanted Jesus to fulfill their current need, solve their current problem. How many of us get in that kind of shape? Oh Lord, can you fix this? Can you fix this? Fix the current problem. I'm going to come back to him. And you have a lot of people that are following Jesus around today when they're in their time of need. Or they come back to him when this has happened. And hey listen, my bottom has fell out of my life. Or this has gone wrong. Or something's happened happened to my marriage or something's happened to my job or the doctor told me this so they're following Jesus for that immediate need can you fix this now can you fix this now they were so willing to put forth that labor for their current problem he told them I can solve your current need but I can also solve your eternal need and that they should seek him for th that reason that they should put effort into gaining what he shall give unto them. And I like the context of this. And I did a little, little uh, investigating here. In verse 27 of John 6, it's interesting here. And I've missed this all these years. And it jumped out to me. He says, but labor for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man, hold on a second, shall give unto you. Shall here in context is in future tense. It doesn't mean what he has given you. It means what he will give, give you. But he says, you can't be focused on what I will give you until you remember what I have given you. Now, verse 28, they ask him how to do this. And Jesus answered in verse 29 and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe on him. He has sent and Jesus was saying, I am the work of God. God sent me to take care of your current need and your eternal need. So if Jesus is what God sent to take care of their need, then Jesus sounds a little bit like manna, doesn't he? So they asked Jesus, what kind of miracle are you going to do so that we can believe? They wanted to be fed again, basically. There's people saying, hey, uh, by the way, uh, we, we believe in you everything. And hey, what miracle are you going to do? And then they had the, the audacity. You know, have you ever had that person or those people that knew what they wanted to get from you so they manipulated the conversation? See, these people wanted to be fed again. They had a free meal. He fed the 5,000. And they followed him to Capernaum because here he was doing this miracle. So they even baited the conversation and said, hey, what sign are you going to show us so that we can believe this? Hey, uh... Just out of the blue, I remember when Moses, um, well, he, he had manna come down from heaven and, and God fed everybody. That was a great miracle. <laughs> 
Not that we're hungry or anything, but uh, that's a pretty good miracle, feeding all of us again. You get what they're saying? But they didn't know they were walking right in to what Jesus wanted them to ask. Because Jesus, <laughs> and I love it, you know, Jesus took what they said and basically they were saying God performed the miracle of giving manna to our forefathers when they were in the wilderness. They actually quoted Exodus 16, 4. I want you to look in verses 30 and 31 of John 6. It says, our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. Anytime you see as it is written, that means it's in the Old Testament canon of Scripture. Listen. It says, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Beautiful. Now, I want you to see what Jesus did with this. They didn't realize is that Jesus had performed the first miracle of feeding the 5,000 with bread and fish so that he could explain to them what they needed to believe in order to have their greatest need fulfilled. In verses 32 through, 45, 32 through 35 of this same John 6, Jesus explains, he can do so much better than me. Listen to his explanation. John 6, 32. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Who's he talking about? Himself. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, hold on, see if we can understand this. See if we can discern this. We don't have to break it down too much. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. It's beautiful that he brings it back around and he knew what they were going to have need for. You see, he was showing them that he was the true bread that came down from heaven. He was the bread that God gave them. And they're the ones that asked the question, hey, what about this sign about uh, like Moses did of having bread come down from heaven? He's saying, I'm that bread. He was the bread that could break the curse. You say, what curse? Remember where we started? The curse of sin. What, what was it? Remember Genesis 3, 17 through 19? In the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat thy bread. Do you know that Jesus broke the curse? The curse, well, it had to do with our daily sustenance. And Jesus said in verse 35, well, I'll read it to you again. You need to underline it. He said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me, hold on, shall never hunger. That's the opposite of Genesis 3, 17. In the sweat of your face, everything you do to make sure that you can get this bread that God provides for you. And he's saying, I'm the bread of life. You come to me, you'll never hunger. Guys, that ought to have us jump in pews this morning. Nobody can make that promise to you, but yet we seek all these other ways. Well, if I go do this and I get trained for this and, and I put myself in here and I apply myself here, it's going to help me in life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And he basically is recalling them back to that time and he's saying, remember that bread? Remember that bread that fell from heaven? I'm that bread. That bread, that bread fell so that you could understand the bread that I am. That's huge. You see, the bread that man has to labor and work to have to meet our own temporary need each day, to keep us alive for a short while on the earth, has been replaced by the true bread of life, which is Jesus. He's the bread that we have to eat in order to break the curse of sin and have a life of fellowship with God and have eternal life in the presence of God. Hallelujah. He said that he, cometh, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. And Jesus was saying, you have to come to me and believe that I am the bread that you need more than any other bread. And if you do, you'll never have to be in need again. Like, listen to his message. You say, well, that's good. He doesn't stop. If you want to see him drive at home, the greatest preacher in the world, Jesus Christ, then read verse 36 through 40. 
He told them, you actually have seen me, you've seen and heard me, and you still don't believe. What does that mean? You still think you're going to get your bread some other way. You still don't believe that I'm the bread of life. You still want, using your own power to meet your own daily needs. But I promise you, if you come to me and believe me, if you believe that I'm the bread that you need, I will never cast you out of my provision. And in verses 41 through 58, I can't believe it, but the Jews murmured again because Jesus said he was the bread of life. So in verse 47, Jesus made this comment again. Don't know how we can get around this fact. Verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Amen. You notice how clearly he explained this? You can read the rest of this chapter, verses 49 through 58. You'll be able to see that through our coming to him and believing in who he is as the son of God, by using his flesh and blood that he would freely give us as a sacrifice to break the curse of sin that we're under, by us believing this, we are eating his body and we're taking him inside of us. I want you to understand today as we take the Lord's Supper, well, it's a picture of what we're doing when we believe on him. Look at verse 52, excuse me, 53. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread, hold on, which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Amen. It, can it get any more clear? He's saying, I am the true manna. There were many that say, what is it? Who is it? And I'll keep trying to do it my way. He said, but if you come to me and you take of me. And he said, hey, look at this translation. And of course, he offended a, a lot of legalistic uh, people that were there. A lot of the Jews that knew that it was a sin even to eat meat that had blood in it. For him to say, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood. They said, I can't believe he's saying that. It's Jesus, man. Don't question Jesus. He was making a reference to the manna. He's saying, you have to take me inside of you. Well, how do you do that? Well, Jesus gave himself. He came from heaven, just like that manna. He fell in a little womb, a little maiden in Bethlehem. She was born, he was born in Bethlehem to Mary. And he came and he grew up and he gave his sinless life for us. Amen. Why? Well, because that's the only thing that could sustain us. It's the only thing that could give us real life. He's the only bread that we can eat and live forever. As he said, he's the only true bread, but we have to take him. We can't just leave him on that cross. We can't just leave him in that tomb. We can't even just leave him saying he resurrected. You say, well, if you believe he died, if you believe he was buried, if you believe he was resurrected, I've heard people say before, if you believe that, then you are saved. You, have, you can believe that as a point of history. You have to take that belief into you and eat it. It has to become part of you in order for you to be able to be sustained by that bread. If you take that, that it's given here in this earth and say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, I believe what he did, but you don't eat it. What are you saying, pastor? If you take it and store it, that manna will spoil. The only way that manna would give life is if they put it inside of them. Isn't that big? Isn't that good? We have to put him inside of us. Why? Because he's the bread of life. He said, don't forget. Remember the bread. What is he telling us? Well, he tells us the same thing he told his disciples in Luke 22. You see, Jesus gathered those disciples together at that Passover meal before he went to the cross and gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin. That last Passover, 
became the first Lord's Supper, which we call Holy Communion. And when you read chapter 22, verse 14 through 20, listen to Jesus' words. And I say this in closing. So when the hour was come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, What desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer? For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do, what? You know what he's saying? He's saying, remember the bread. Remember the bread that sustained them? Remember, I'm the bread. Now he's saying to us 2,000 years after, remember when I became the bread? Have you eaten the bread? Did it sustain you? Well, if you have, are you praising me the way you need to? As life gets busy and you've got all these other challenges, are you remembering the thing that I did for you? So take this day and make sure that you've cleared your heart and come to me is what he's saying. Child of mine and remember me specifically this day. There's nothing more important than me and you. I'm your sustenance. I sustain you. Remember me. Gave him the bread and said, remember, take this in remembrance of me. Why? Well, to the disciples, I'm going to be that bread. Well, they already knew. They'd heard the sermon. I'm the bread of heaven. I'm the true bread. And I'm the bread of life. I'm the manna that God rained out of heaven. To me and you, he gave his life. He gave his blood. What is he telling us? He's saying it's easy to get caught up in this world about everything that you think you would like to happen. Here's what I want to happen with my job. Here's what I want to happen with my kids. If I can just do this, if I can just, here's what I want to happen with my marriage relationship. Here's what I want to happen with my income. Here's what I want to happen with my retirement. Here's what I want to happen with this day. How many of those thoughts? And then, so here's what we'll do and we'll put this plan into place. And hey, in the middle of all that, guess what? We forget who he is. Remember me today. That's what he says. If you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, He gave His body, He gave His life for you. Why? He was sinless and we are not. And we're separated from God unless we take the only thing that can cover our sin, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. If you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior today, I beg you, call out to Him today. You can't just believe there's a God. You have to take him into you. How do you take him into you? Ask him. And tell him. You say, tell him, yeah. Tell him is professing. God, I believe in who you are. Jesus, I believe in what you did. Confessing. I'm a sinner. I need you. I need bread. He'll give it to you. He said, if you come to him, and he'll no wise cast you out. The bread of heaven has to be taken inside of you, not inside of here, inside of here. You can ask him today, and he will save you. You'll come into a relationship with God. And then I tell Christians that are here today that are in the room, brother and sister in Christ, there are a lot of distractions in this world. I want you to set your mind aside right now to remember what was done for you as we take this Lord's Supper. To remember who you are in Him. And then maybe, in a matter of conviction, maybe it's a good time for us to remember that He's done it all for us and He's provided for us and He'll keep providing for us. But maybe it's a good time for us to look at ourselves and say, what are we trying to do without you? To apply my life by these principles, am I really using you as my bread or is it just stored over here? He saith that, it should cause us to repent and come close to God. Listen, I pray that lives are changed today by us being able to implement one phrase. What is it? Remember the bread. So if you remember the bread today in Jesus and I remember the bread, it should cause us to take an examination of our life. 
I want you to make sure your heart is clear and clean today before we go into this time of, of Holy Communion and the Lord's Supper because he tells us if we have something against him, not even take it. So use this time of invitation. If you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, please come. We'll pray together. But if you have, come and praise him or get right with him or rededicate your mission to be able to use him as your bread and not your own power. Whatever it takes, whatever he said to you, this is the message that was spoken. The invitation is your chance to respond. Remember, a conversation is only a conversation if somebody speaks back. Stand with me. Father God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this day and I pray God that you would take this time, take this message. I pray God as we remember the bread today, where we remember Jesus Christ and what you've done for us. I pray God that it would change lives. If there's someone here that's lost today, I pray they would see their need for salvation. Lord, for all those that are here today, Lord, who are saved, I pray God that you would just let us be able to, to Lord, firm our life with you right now. See ourselves and see our relationship with you. Change lives, I pray, during this invitation. Let nothing else matter. Clear our mind from any distraction. And God, I pray that you would just call your children to that closer relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.